get by It resides between my eyes Walked through the fire Came out better on the other side See lights like a peach If you find the sand And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the CEOs or founders of Big Commerce, Zapier, Buffer, P90X, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Um, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran. Our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. Uh, we do that through our done-for-you services. We have a complete done-for-you event solution. For big conferences or software companies, we have a podcast, Done For You Podcast Solution, which in my opinion, Patrick, is the best thing I've done for my my life and my business outside of my wife. She yelled at me the other day about that, saying that. Um, <laughs> and I know you're big into content too, so I want to go into that. And a Done For You lead generation service. But our greater purpose is our mission behind why we do everything, which is we realize that our grandfathers were a big inspiration to us. And my grandfather was a Holocaust survivor who escaped from Germany and him and his brother were the only survivors in their family. And while that was happening, my business partner's grandfather was um, a B-17 captain and flew 35 missions over Nazi Germany. And so to honor our grandfather's legacies, we have a scholarship um, and it's a veteran entrepreneur scholarship. Um, it can be anywhere from an all expense paid trip to the conference that we're doing, a comp conference ticket. We just had someone uh, recently, we had a San Diego one. They want, you know, Richard Branson was the keynote at that one. Um, and we did a VIP event the day before. They got flight, hotel, conference ticket, meals, everything paid for. So if you know a veteran entrepreneur or you are one yourself, you can apply to a future event that we're doing, um, rise25.com slash mission. And you'll see the background you can apply. So feel free to send it to someone um, who's in need or someone who's even further along and just wants to see what cool events they can go to. But let's get on. I'm excited to talk to Patrick and it's been a long time coming. Um, we have Patrick Campbell. He's co-founder of ProfitWell and Patrick has grown ProfitWell from nothing in 2012 and we'll find out what 2012 looked like in, I think it was in your bedroom somewhere, um, to over <laughs> $10 million and 70 staff um, and ProfitWell has a free product that integrates with tools like Stripe and Braintree to bring all of your subscription and financial metrics together in one place. Um, they have numerous paid products that help SaaS companies grow. You know, I, I have this joke, Patrick, all the SaaS companies, um, founders I know, I want to make a t-shirt, maybe I just should, just got churn, question mark, and just send it to them <laughs> because I feel that's always the topic of conversation. Um, they have numerous paid products. I digress. Um, that helps SaaS companies grow, like price intelligently retain, which all SaaS companies want to retain their customers and a few others. Um, they have over 10,000 companies now using ProfitWell. Um, companies like Big Commerce, ClassPass, Zenefits, Meetup, Calendly, Masterclass. Um, I'm fascinated by Masterclass, by the way. Um, but yeah, thanks for joining well. me, Patrick. Yeah, thanks for being here, man. And I didn't know about the veteran scholarship. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I, uh, I come from a Navy family. You do. So, yeah, yeah. And so it's it's one of those things. I mean, reserves. My dad did a couple tours, though. Um, he's a CB, which was like construction battalion. So he's like a union tinner that wanted to do the whole reserve thing. And it turned into basically a second full-time job, which wow. he loved. And so, yeah, a little bit of a mix of that. I, I didn't have the whole brat status, if you will, of moving around. But uh, definitely something I really appreciate, the veteran community. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I feel like it's there's a backbone to the U.S., right? And entrepreneurs <laughs> is a backbone and veterans are a backbone. I think the combination is just a, a large, very strong backbone. And that's kind of why we want to serve not just veterans, not just entrepreneurs, but, you know, that together. Um, so appreciate your dad's service and everything like that. And I want to start there, actually. Most people want to dig into churn and, you know, have you talk about <laughs> free versus paid. And we will get to that and what it was like in 2012 and the amazing companies, how you've got them on board. Um, but growing up in Wisconsin, what was it yeah. like growing up in Wisconsin? Because your parents were not entrepreneurs. No, no, they're they're kind of I don't know if it's the opposite, but uh, yeah, dad's a big union guy. Um, he was a sheet metal worker. He basically worked on a lot of the high rises in Milwaukee 
and surrounding areas basically doing the uh, um, the flashing the metal parts of roofs basically and uh, yeah it's kind of fascinating is is you know being a union big union family it's like very anti entrepreneurial almost not in the also. sense of do your own work, but in the sense of management is the enemy, right? Um, not the enemy, but like in Fight some cases, power. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, when you're, you know, we went through a bunch of strikes when I was a kid, um, you know, trying to, and some of them were long, some of them were short. I know some of them were long in the sense of like, you know, we had to, my dad had to find like odd jobs and side jobs just to kind of pay the bills. And so there's a little bit of that entrepreneur, um, you know, get stuff done, but kind of uh, a little bit anti-management. Like my dad and I still debate and to argue about like, oh, you know, oh, it's management, corporate, you know, they're bad. And I'm like, well, that's kind of what you're I like, am, dad. Yeah, like, I am now corporate. <laughs> yeah, um, and I'm trying to convince them that there's another way, you know, you don't, I mean, yes, obviously labor laws are really important, but there's, there's, there are good, you know, entrepreneurs out there. And then my mom, you know, a little bit entrepreneurial in the sense that she worked from being on an assembly line um, at Lisan Electric um, back in the day, Electric Motors in Grafton, Wisconsin, and then worked her way into being an EA and then um, basically taking over like trade show marketing over like 30 years, basically. And so, mm. Yeah, but uh, grew up in a town with more cows than people. You know, we were more we were close to to Milwaukee, but it was a very, uh, you know, I don't know how stereotypical, but pretty stereotypical, like you know, Midwest upbringing or Wisconsin mm -hmm. upbringing, if that makes sense. At what point did you know, Patrick? I'm going to do this entrepreneur thing because you worked for Google too, right? What was yeah. what was that like? Well, so I I didn't know I wanted to be an entrepreneur until my mid twenties actually. Uh, so I, you know, classic, you know, when you go come from a blue collar family um, and a similar probably background, you know, with your family. Yeah. Just what did you want to be? I'm gonna have to. I have to. What did you want to be when you grew up? At that point. Yeah, that's, it. that's what I was just gonna say. Okay. I was like, I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to be a cardiovascular surgeon. Really? That's my big thing. Yeah, like I wanted to do that, right? Um, and my my dad. To that sounds this day, terrible to me. Yeah. Still, well, it was, and it's, it's eventually it sounded terrible to me too. But my dad <laughs> still to this day is like, well, why don't you can still go be a doctor? And I'm like, Dad, I'm over 30 now. Like, I can't be a doctor anymore. Like, I could, but it would be a weird career shift. Uh, and then I wanted to be a lawyer because I um, I did speech and debate in high school and college. That's why I went to Bradley, um, as we were talking about before we were recording. And um, yeah, that's that's one of those things where basically I was like, ah, I don't know. Then I want to go save the world. And I worked for the government. I worked in the intelligence community, and um, it was super bureaucratic. So I thought, oh. Tech let me go work and try to get a job at Google. And I did that. Um, and then I jumped out finally, you know, after working, you know, basically a couple of years in the workforce, um, worked for a startup and, and basically kind of got, got the bug. Mm. Uh, and I think it's out of hubris mainly or, or arrogance, depending on how you look at it, because it was more around, like, I always cared more than my boss. Um, mm. And, and it wasn't, I don't know why, or I don't know if it's from a, I think it's from like a good place and a bad place. Like my, my dad, like growing up, like, it was always like, ah, oh, got to do the job right. Got to do the job right. Like, got to get it done. Like, no, mm. we're going to redo that because got to do the job right. Mm. I think that I I really inherited that. So it was always like, ah, oh, no, I can I can do this better. Oh, I can do the job right, right? Which, you know, you know, in a, a white collar sense is not always the best mindset, uh, you know, in, in corporate America. And so I think that that kind of led to like, you know, basically jumping out and like, oh, I can do better. I can do this on my own. Then getting kicked in the face by bootstrapping a company and then, you know, kind of realizing that it's a good balance, if that makes sense. What was Google like? It was... Um, What'd you learn from there? No. Yeah. So I was on the business side. So it's a little bit different business side versus uh, engineering side. I mean, I think what I learned is like, it's a phenomenal place to work. Um, I actually got sick. Um, I got cancer. Um, everything's great. But you know, whenever you drop the hard C, you got a preface or, or post post there. Um, everything's great now, but I got sick there. And so it was like, and that really kind of showed how amazing of a place it is to work. Um, so I didn't you, see you were at Google at the time. Yeah. The, so I've un for better or for worse, I've gotten it twice at this point. Um, and so yeah. one one time I got cancer um, was in um, in 2011 when I was at Google. Um, and the other time was um, basically a few years ago, about four years ago, when I uh, when I was in the midst of you know the early days of, of Profitwell, uh, then called Price Intelligently. But at Google, it was it was it was actually great because I didn't see a bill, I didn't even see it, I didn't even see a receipt like or anything. Like just everything was paid for. Mm. My manager was like, "You want to." keep getting paid and just not come into work that's totally fine like mm. that's just kind of the They're culture super right? supportive 
Well, and they're just like anything that could be an objection to you working and getting your job done, they will take care of, which I think is amazing. And they overpay you for what you're doing. Like, you know, I can very in hindsight say I was overpaid for what I was doing. Um, but it was, it was amazing. But the other side of it was you are in a, at that point, 25, 30,000 person company, um, which means no matter how amazing it is, it's still very bureaucratic. And if you're, you know, a young, ambitious kid, um, you know, with, you know, basically that's really hard because they're like, you got to stay in your role for two years before you can even think of moving or think of getting promoted. Uh, and they basically kind of put these constraints and I kind of wiggled my way out of some of those constraints, but it was one of those things where, um, ultimately I wanted a lot more freedom. And I think that's been a common theme in, in kind of my career where it's just like the freedom has been something, the freedom of to act has really been something that's been a driving force and it's worked out well in some ways and not so well in other ways. But I think it's, um, I think it's definitely something that's, that's been driving and why I left Google, for instance. Yeah. I mean, Patrick, in everything in your accomplishments and things that I've researched and even graduating top of your class at Bradley 4.0, you know, I see as one of the most impressive things, um, and I don't know the details of is, is really, um, I remember interviewing the, the founder of, um, baby Einstein and she didn't, she's like, I'm not a cancer survivor. I'm a cancer terminator or something. You know, she just, you know, <laughs> like, he's like, I didn't survive. Like I just terminated or whatever, you know, extinguished. Yeah, yeah. It. And, um, I get that. So that's, that deal, you know, battling that, working with that and, and forging ahead is, is just super impressive. And I want to see if you could, you know, in 2011, um, what happened? Like, how did, I want to hear what happened, how you found out about it and, yeah. um, how you dealt with it mentally because it's, it's, it's life changing, you know? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And what's funny is I haven't, I haven't really talked about that. I don't think ever publicly. Um, and if it's I too think, hard, just say, Jeremy, oh, no. you're, that's, I, that's a question no, I'm, no. I'm not, I'm not ready to deal with right now. No, so. no, it's hopefully I am. Cause it's been a long time. Yeah. I, like I've definitely talked like publicly about the cancer and stuff like that, but the, the history and stuff is, is I don't think I've, I've really talked about what, What's kind of funny is I like, you know, when, when you say something like, Oh, survivor terminator and stuff like that, I almost, there's this weird sense of like, um, and I, I think this is like an entrepreneur thing, right? Where there's this weird sense of like, it's not an accomplishment, right? Like there's the next thing, right? And that's, I think that's bad and good depending on how you look at it. But for me, it's kind of, you know, I, I like what I want to tell you is like, well, it was kind of like the wussy form. They caught it early. Like, you know, I had surgery and chemo, but then, you know, the second time it was just radiation and like, you know what I mean? Like I want to, you know, downplay it, but I think that, you know, it was a, it was a huge huge impact on my mental, like my mental model of myself. And the way I found out, um, so I, uh, was, you know, being a young early twenties guy, like working out a lot. Invincible at that point, stuff. Yeah, you know? totally. And it's, you know, it's not invincible. Like, Hey, I can take a speeding bullet, but it's like, this thing's going to last a while. Right. Like this whole, like I got, you know, I could figure that out in my thirties, my forties, et cetera. And so, um, that was, I, I, I noticed that I had a little bit of, um, uh, disproportionate, uh, like, size on my pecs actually. So I had mm. breast cancer the first time. And so I was like, oh, that's like natural, but I'm a righty. So you'd think my right would be bigger than We could than totally left. justify it away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it was my left. And so like, it kind of hurt a little bit. Um, and I, um, I have this, uh, you know, syndrome that's like non, you know, non life threatening or anything that I've had just was born with it, um, in my DNA. Um, and so I, I go see an endocrinologist, um, you know, often. And so I went into the endocrinologist and I was like, yeah, like there's something that's kind of like bothering me. Um, and he kind of felt it and there's like some bumps there's like you know basically a, a lump if you will yeah. um and so i went and got a um um oh god what's it called a, a uh, mammogram yeah well it wasn't a mammogram it was a, it's like um, a men's version of it it first yeah it was first a um ultrasound there it was just ultrasound. to kind of like see if there's something else going on and then they like saw these nodules basically in, in my in my left side and then they saw them also on my right and then they did a fine needle biopsy basically um which is kind of like a mammogram essentially and then they um you know then they were like yep it's positive and so the, the mental model though is like it's kind of the best way to describe it is is that invincibility that you were kind of talking about. You go from this place of, oh, like, I'm not even going to worry about these things, you know, in young hubris, right? And I'm going to – now I have to kind of like face it where – 
and the, the the weird part is, and God forbid, and you, like you have to go through this. Anyone has to go through this, um, you know, in your family. Like, and I'm sure, and unfortunately, statistically, you probably will happen. But it's funny how unscientific treatment is. Mm. Like, it's just it's just hilarious. Like, if you really look into it, because. They come to you and they're like, okay, well, you're young and like it's real early and, you know, we don't think it's spread anywhere else. Your blood levels are good. So we have like these three options. One option is like, we think you'll be okay. Think. These are the words they use. We think you're going to be fine. Then there's like this nuclear option, which is going to like make you sick and do all this kind of stuff. You got to have surgery and everything. And, and there's like an in-between option. And you're like, well, what should I do? And they're like, well, you decide. And you're like, I am not an expert. Right. Like I'm not an expert, right? And I'm WebMDing, which is like the worst thing thing you can Worst do possible you know, thing medical. yeah yeah and so long story short it it it, it kind of you, you're forced to kind of one grow up and you're forced to kind of face that mortality and and i think that yeah. what really helped me is i you know i have accepted death if that makes sense and i think that a lot of us don't do that until we're dying and i wasn't i wouldn't characterize myself as dying in any of these situations but i think that I am not afraid to die and I'm not, af- and I, I started kind of, you know, in a cliche manner, kind of living how I wanted to live. And I was like, no, nope. yeah. that's what, that's what started me leaving Google. And I was like, I, this is like, I don't want to waste away for the next seven to eight years trying to become a level three salesperson. This is not what I want to do. And so let me go find what I needed to do. And I think that helped a lot and it helped shift that mindset. And it's not to say like, when and if I'm dying, like actually like fully dying, like I'm definitely going to be sad, but it is one of those things where it was a nice kick in the pants in order to just like, Mm. all right, let's go, let's live. Because honestly, like, and this is the, maybe the pragmatic piece of this, like if you're probably, if you're listening to this podcast, just given demographics, like I'm sure you have adversity in your life and it might be a lot of adversity, but you probably can get a job right? Like you might not get the job you want. You might not want to like work in the place, but like I kind of got to this point where I was like, I got to go for it. I got to go figure this out. Mm. Worst case scenario, I'll go back and be a barista at Starbucks. Yep. Not going to be enough money for me to get everything I want and all this other stuff, but like I'll be able to survive. And that's probably most people listening to this. Um, and that's that mindset really just kind of got me into the right place, the right Mm. headspace. Just let me go. What did you change? So you said one of the things at the time, you're like, I don't want to be a level three manager. So yeah, what did you yeah. change? You left to Google and what did you do differently? It could be business or in your life in general. Like, you know, what did you do? Yeah. So I, I mean, I, it wasn't an immediate thing, if that makes sense. It wasn't like this moment where I just came yeah. home and broke up with my girlfriend and, you know, quit my job and all these other things all at once. It was, it was more of a little bit of a gradual and there were other things happening. I think I was still trending in this direction, but I think what I did is I was like, I, what you noticed, what I noticed at Google is people stayed there less than two years or they stayed there for seven or eight years. That mm. was kind of average. Um, because yeah, if you're getting paid too much to do what you're doing, it's you the golden mortgage. handcuffs. Yeah, yeah it's like, exactly. You're like, I'm going to stay on this treadmill for a while because now I got bills and I like going out on Friday and all this other stuff. And so I think for me, it was it was a little bit of a wake-up call that I needed to go find something else. I got a little bit more involved in the startup community in Boston. Um, and I and what's funny is like no one at Google was involved in the startup community. They all want to start companies, but they're not really involved because you're at Google. So you're just like, you know, everything's amazing. And then basically, um, you know, met the CEO of the company that I ended up leaving um, Google for. And was like, cool, like I had the confidence now to basically go and do it. And I think that if I hadn't had the experience with cancer um, and some of the other things that were going on, I wouldn't have, you know, gone and and made that leap. I think I would have been too hesitant. So 2012, you're in your talk about the start of the of the company. Yeah, so late 2011 into 2012, I was at this company called Jimvara, which is um, customizable jewelry. So it's kind of like Blue Nile, if you've heard of this. But yeah, of basic, course. Yeah, the basic premise is like, um, you know, you, you, your diamonds, you're typically only buying one in your life, hopefully. Um, and But gemstones, there's, there's multiple purchases. And theoretically, if you customize something, um, everything's kind of better, right? Like even if it's just like the, the actual gemstones to match the birthstones, the color of their eyes and the color of the sunset, mm. all these other things, like theoretically, you would have a better intrinsic connection with that and the response you got, and then you would buy more jewelry over time. And so that was kind of the thesis or, or part of 
the thesis of the company. And I, I wasn't like a founder or anything. I came in, um, you know, I, I took a huge pay cut and ended up coming in as a um, basically a, a project manager or a product manager, I guess, would be the better way to look at it. And I quickly moved into what's called strategic initiatives, which is a kitchen sink role where basically like, hey, we don't know what this is. You're smart and relatively cheap. Let's just give it to you for time for a little while. Um, and then if you succeed, great. We'll hand it off to someone else. If you don't, cool. It wasn't like a big deal. And so one of the projects I ended up working on was um, pricing there. And um, it was my first experience at a company that was basically 100 employees. Um, we fluctuated a little bit down, a little bit up uh, while I was there in nine months, right? So that's, you know, they raised a bunch of money and all that kind of fun stuff. And so um, I, I, I realized, and, and this is kind of the, you know, the the drafting of the the cancer momentum, let's call it. Uh, basically, um, it was like a culture that I wasn't really enamored by. It was kind of like the classic problem. I didn't interview enough about the company. I didn't research enough about the company, which on one hand was good because I probably wouldn't have made the leap then. But on the other hand, it was, or excuse me, um, yeah, but the, on the other hand, it was like bad because it was like, wow, like I don't like this part of the culture. I don't like that part of the culture. And then going back to that young hubris of like, I can do better. I care more, et cetera. I was like, maybe I should do something on my own. And at this point, my relationship with, um, my, my partner at the time wasn't great. Um, there was a lot of conflict with, between me and her. And so it was like, let's, let's, you know, make a change. Let's like jump in and, and do something. And so, um, I met up with a couple of, um, part-time co-founders and which is a big mistake, I think. Um, but again, it led me here. So maybe it wasn't, but it was just one of those big things. Big mistake. Why? Uh, so part-time co-founder, if someone's full-time and the other people are part-time, I think you have to you have it should be like everyone's second or third or fourth company. It shouldn't be their first company. So for us it was all of our first company. So we were all kind of like we had worked at other companies, but it was our first like founding company. And so I think expectations weren't aligned. We didn't know what expectations to set. We didn't know like how to best structure the cap table. What happens if they don't come on full time? Um what happens yeah. if, you know, I I didn't know what what questions to answer and and the most like non-charitable interpretation of of the situation is oh these guys are trying to screw me over because they're part-time and i'm not and i'm doing all the work and they're not doing there's resentment yeah totally yeah and that was that was like a four to five year like journey of figuring all that out but i think that the the charitable interpretation is like we just didn't know what we were doing right and so it caused a lot of stress it caused a lot like just unneeded stress unneeded like problems i had to like threaten to tank the company a few times like it was just like real bad and i'm, I'm happy to get into it it was just not great but it was it was one of those things you know, where they the thing is that's that's more common than people realize i mean there, so i think everyone has some kind of situation where a partnership or someone it just doesn't it's like a marriage i mean that's what it is yeah. right and we know how that can be, you know, whatever the divorce rate is, 50%. Well, you yeah. know, we could probably extrapolate that to, to co-founders. Yeah, and I think that the, um, yeah, it's just it's just one of those things too where I think it's more complicated too because it's it's supposed to be unemotional. It's supposed to be like, we are business people. Like I have my, you know, sport coat on and all that kind of stuff. And in reality, like founding a company is like a marriage. It's just more emotional in some cases in a marriage because, you know, you, you feel weird about being vulnerable. Whereas in a marriage, you still probably feel weird, but less weird. Right. Um, or you shouldn't feel weird, but you do, if that makes sense. And mm -hmm. so I think that, um, and everything is great now. They're part of the company still. And, and we figured out all the not great things, but I think it was one of those things where it was, it was a really bumpy founding and not necessarily in like the first six months. Like it was bumpy because it's like me in a room. Um, it wasn't my bedroom. Um, it was, uh, we, we rented, a like a, it was, we called it, or I called it basically the prison cell because it was, this, it what was an this endearing term. <laughs> yeah, no, but it was, it was, it was really funny because it was like this conference room in this old building in Boston. Um, we rented from, um, our friends, uh, Sarah Hodges and Dave Bolter, who are kind of, you know, big parts of the entrepreneur community here in Boston, but it was in one of their offices and the window, you couldn't see out of the window, but the window was high. I see. Yeah. Yeah. And you saw this light and it was it's like, like Shawshank brick. Redemption. Yeah. Yeah. It was like this old brick too. So, and, and we basically rented the room. And so I crammed, you know, myself in there and then like five, six interns you know because i thought wow. oh let's just get heads you know in order to uh you know get stuff going but 
you know, it was, it was, it was tough. It was like the classic, you know, boot, especially being bootstrapped. We had no money. I was racking up the credit card debt. Um, I was burning my savings down to pay my personal bills and stuff like that. And so, yeah, I think it was one of those things where it was super tough. And I think the, the turning point was, um, we started selling stuff, right? And it was like stuff. I say it's stuff because that's what it was. It was like not a pure, like we were selling this pure software product and then we like quickly pivoted to this tech enabled service. And when I say we, it was basically just me. And then what ended up happening is we, in our first, you know, we June 15th, 2012, was the first day of the company. By December 2012, um, I had sold like 140 to 150 thousand dollars, and rather than like, raising my salary yeah. or anything like that, I was like, "Oh, we need to hire." So I brought Peter on, uh, mm. Peter Zotto, who is the first full-time uh, person, and he's now our GM. Mm. Uh, he's been with the company, but that was you know. What were Peter's you looking for? Like, what were you looking uh, to hire? What 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 did you want someone was, to do? That was a tough question. I think for me, we were looking at let's bring in someone who can take off one part of the problem. And the most ambiguity was around the pricing products, like what that product was going to become. Like, yeah. was it going to stay a tech enabled service? Were we going to go down to pure software? Were we going to go up to pure consulting? Like, what was that going to look like? Um, and then because of that ambiguity, I took that on and then he came in and basically took over sales and revenue generation. Um, and he's, you know, frankly been crushing it ever since, which is great. Don't worry, we've had bad quarters, but it was like not uh, consistently. It's just been, you know, awesome, which is great. So I want to hear about some of those traction points because I know you have some interesting philosophies around content. I think early on you had a single PDF that built traction, some early traction. But yeah. talk about the product itself because I know there's a lot of iteration and pivot with the company. What they start off doing is really not what they end up doing. What did the yeah. early product look like when you were saying talking about it? And then what does it look like now with – profit well in some of the, I know, I think you have five products right now. What, what did it yeah. look like then? And then bring me to, to current. Yeah. So it was, it was basically a search for the thesis that we wanted to attack. And so, and I, th that'll make sense in a second. So we started off with pricing. We, we, all build these products or do these things. It takes a lot of time. And then when it comes time to ascribe value to it, AKA the price, we're like, I don't know, let's just put something out there. Right? Like that's the basic process. Totally. I mean, yeah, even what seems like sophisticated founders and products as how'd you yeah. come to that? You know, we threw it up through a nine we see at the if end it of works, it. And then yeah. we increase it until people start churning off of that. And we back off from there type of thing. Yeah. 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 So it gets, so it's very unsophisticated. Yeah. So we Talk were like, okay, about pricing. let's, yeah. let's solve that. Right. So we had this product, um, that built with the, the part-time co-founders that was basically, um, it was a survey tool. So we built these algorithms in the back end. You, we would, it had a link where you'd send out the survey, the survey would get filled with results that you would bring. And then all of a sudden we'd crunch the numbers and then we'd give you these numbers and a little bit of an explanation on those numbers. And the problem was, is that there was a confidence gap where basically people, they could understand the data, some didn't, but most could, but then they were like too scared to basically act because pricing, again, we don't do it. And even if you've done it once before, you're still kind of like jittery about it. And so then all of a sudden they asked us, hey, can we pay you to help us? Like almost like add service to it. Mm. And we were like, sure, but the price is gonna be way up here now versus this $50 a month product. And they're like, yeah, okay. And we're like, oh, okay. So that kind of rolled this like tech enabled service, but all of a sudden the thesis started to become, okay, collecting data through surveys has a lot of benefits. It has some problems, but is there a better way we can get this other data to kind of fulfill our mission of trying to give you data-driven pricing? Or how can we get closer to the success of data-driven pricing? Mm -hmm. And while we were thinking through that, we ended up um, helping a company that was about to IPO with their pricing, and we discovered they were calculating their monthly recurring revenue and their churn completely incorrectly. Mm. So we had this moment where we're like, okay, we're trying to get this data already. We're not sure exactly how we're going to get it, but then we're also like have this situation where this company has a CFO who had taken two other companies public. This is his third, and he's calculating these basic metrics incorrectly. And it wasn't like a philosophical difference on like what should be included and not. It was 
just completely wrong. And so we were like, okay, let's start this product, um, this free subscription financial metrics product. Um, and that's where ProfitWell came from. And then to kind of speed ahead a little bit, um, the reason it's free is because we found out no one wants to pay for analytics, um, or they do, but it's all very like enterprising. And this is why most BI companies go up market. But we started kind of really providing some value in the early days. And then we realized we were like, okay, there's this bigger problem with subscription companies and that's identifying where growth comes from and where those opportunities are and then exploiting those high leverage opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So pricing, one of the highest levers in our business, no one does anything with it, right? Like overall. Yeah. Um, churn, really important. We all say it's important, but then we don't really act on it, right? Unless there's a huge problem, right? We spend all of our money on acquisition. We put all of our effort into acquisition and we don't think about how much money we're getting per customer or like how to retain those customers. And so the thesis started to change to, we really want to use data to understand subscription truth, pass that insight onto our customers, and then build products that are, are basically outcome-based products that help lower your churn, optimize your ARPU, get you more customers, et cetera. And so that's where the thesis has kind of changed mm -hmm. to, hey, let's focus on this, this really big like problem that we can study and we can collect data on and we can identify and then be that partner to those customers or those users and then convert them to customers if they want to use the product that'll make their life easy or give them a ton of content in order to you know, do it themselves if they want to spin it up themselves. Yeah, I want to start. I want to talk about each of those pieces. I think the it'll help us to do that just to break down what are the products. So you have the free sure. analytics. What are yep. the five pr other products, and what and what do they do? Yeah, so we have a free free subscription financial metrics. So mm -hmm. that includes not only your financial metrics, but we also added engagement metrics. Uh, so basic user logins, those types of things. And then we're going to be adding attribution or acquisition metrics. We just started collecting the data, um, and we're going to. It's going to take us a while to make sense of it because that's a really tough problem. And then for the paid products, real quick, what, um, Patrick, on that, sure. what companies should be using this? Um, any subscription company. Mm -hmm. So um, we have companies ranging from, you know, B2B SaaS, like real nerdy, like, you know, enterprise products all the way to uh, ClassPass and MasterClass you mentioned, which yeah. are like content B2C products. We have lots of box of the month clubs. We have all types of subscription companies. Um, yeah. And it's made made for for that, that breadth, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, I will say that like if you're pushing – you know, 75 to $100 million in revenue a year. We have plenty of those people on ProfitWell, but they're probably using like a big BI suite like Looker or something like that. Mm -hmm. Our vision is eventually we will like be on that level, but it's just going to take time because it's a free product. So we always have this like debate of how far we advance the free product versus some of the paid products. And so that's, that's something that's, you know, going to work over time. So it will integrate with maybe their stripe or payment processing to bring in different analytics from their customers yep. yeah any um so we support zora stripe braintree recurly charge b um and we're building new like business or bi or excuse me billing integrations every quarter yeah um and the reason we want to build those, we have an API if you want to spin this up yourself, um, you know, using the the free product. But the reason we're building the billing integration is because it's it's one click. Like literally with Stripe, when you sign yeah. up, it takes less than a minute. You just click the yeah. button, you OAuth in, and then everything's done for you. And that's kind that's of what we cool. want to do. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to tell all the past subscription and software founders <laughs> and Inspired Insider they need to install this. It seems like a no-brainer. Do you get yeah, yeah. like objections? What's the objection? So there's they don't want they're like around, scared about their data or something or um we don't hear no. that as much anymore. No. We definitely heard that in the early days because yeah. you know no one knew Social us right. Proof, yeah. Um, and we also but I mean, we do hear that, but we have like even if they're a free customer, we will or a free user, excuse me, we will sign NDAs. We will you know sign custom T's and C's. Like we do that all the time with people, um, just because it, it's it's a long play, right? Like we want to provide a ton of value. And I and love that. Well, I mean, you want to give value first, and then you know you're gonna help them on the back end, and that's how relationships are built. Totally. You know, absolutely. We yeah. want our our. We won't. Well, like, we say this publicly, but not like on the website. Like our mission is to like make you feel bad for how much value we're giving you for free. It's and then, you know, totally. 
Totally. And then you'll like when you have a pricing question or a retention or any question, you'll come to us and then, you know, we get an app bat to sell you something mm -hmm. um, in a nice way, not in like a tricky way or anything mm -hmm. like that. Something they need. So the five products, tell me yep. about those so, and what they do. Yep. So there's the metrics and engagement. Um, we have a product called Retain, um, which is the best in the world at recovering delinquent churn. Mm. So, um, what does that mean? Yeah. fun fact, yeah, fun fact. So if you are a credit card based business, meaning you get most of your customers through credit cards or most of your payments through credit cards, um, you like 20 to 40% of your churn is basically just because of credit card failures. So basically, if you have 10 people churn, two to four of them, it's because of some mechanical error with the billing system or the credit card. And so mm. we recover about 70 to 80 percent of those people who go delinquent. And um, we do it in a manner that's completely touchless. And the way that we're so good at it is because we're sitting on all this metadata from like 800 million different credit cards, which allows us to basically understand like credit card failures on a bonkers level. Um, and now that product is starting to go after active churn as well. Yeah. So hmm. because we have this engagement data, we understand when to reach out to someone to upgrade them to annual, you know, which reduces churn or when to reach out and, you know, re-engage them if their engagement's low. So that's the retain product which is going to continue to go after voluntary churn. Um, we have a revenue recognition product, which is you know kind of boring, but for any finance or accounting people on here, you know how hard that can be with a subscription business. Um, and it's basically just completely takes off the rev rec of your thousands of customers down to the second, um, which is kind of cool. Uh, and so then who we is that for, the revenue recognition? Is it so still any companies, certain type of subscription companies or... I would say if you have over 500 customers mm -hmm. it's and they're paying by credit card, uh, that is probably a really good product for you. Um, mm -hmm. And the strict reason is because not to teach accounting in a podcast because um, people you know, are think, listening at this point, Patrick, yeah. they have a real yeah. business and they're interested. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes it's good to turn people away if, if this, this is not yeah. for the, watch totally. the first part. It's amazing, heart wrenching story about <laughs> him. This is the, the nitty gritty part. Um, if, totally. if this resonates with you, keep listening. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, yeah. it just takes that revenue recognition completely off your plate. So we do it programmatically. Um, we've had it audited by the big four um, mm -hmm. accounting firms. And so it's like really works really, really well, especially with that high volume. And then we have price intelligently that, um, you know, is, is basically that tech enabled service that, you know, we plug into your business, basically get insight on willingness to pay all that kind of fun stuff mm. um, and then help you with your pricing using data, essentially. You, you forgot the most important part about all of these, which is uh -huh. the retain thing. Um, you take a piece of it, so there's no upfront cost for it, right? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So That's a huge value really proposition. Let's talk I'm trying about, not yeah. to sell. I'm trying not to sell. No, but I mean, <laughs> it's people learn um, how, you, how you price and how you do things, sure. right? Totally. So I think it's a, it's a great conversation to have. And I love... No, from the direct response marketer copywriter in me, I geek out on that stuff. And a no-brainer oh, offer cool. is key. If you could do yeah. as close, like with our VIP events and those things, it's a no-brainer offer. Like we actually don't charge any money for it. Yeah, we share in what we create. So why wouldn't they have us? So the same thing goes for the retain. So talk about how you came yeah. to that because you could easily charge for something like that different ways. Totally. So, yeah, but the thing is, is like we love, I love outcome based products, right? So if you can get like with pricing, the closer you get to the value that you're providing, the better your pricing is, right? And the purest form of value for most products is the money you bring in, the cost you save, the time you save, et cetera, right? Yeah. But for most of our products, it's really hard to measure that, right? So HubSpot, it's a company we've all probably heard of, like they, they can bring in their marketing automation and they can bring you a bunch of revenue, right? But then all of a sudden it's like, well, how much of that revenue is attributed to HubSpot versus your work versus your ideas, et cetera, right? For us with Retain, we can actually measure, here's where your recovery rate was, mm -hmm. let's say it's 25%. We raised it to 50%, and this is how much money you're bringing in and how long those customers are gonna stick around. So we're just gonna take 
one month basically and they're banned so it gets a little bit better especially with volume in terms of like how much we actually take and then we'll guarantee that those users stick around for one month more so basically it's like guaranteed 100 percent roi and like i think the average amount of time that the user will stick around afterwards is like eight to ten months so it's like no brainer roi um but that like the more you can get there with your pricing the better off it is but if you don't have the luxury of being able to perfectly measure it, you just want to kind of go back and think, what are the proxies for that thing that I'm bringing in terms of value? And that's why, like marketing automation, it's like contacts or you know the CMS or things like that. I mean, this is a serious, serious pain point. You know what I mean? Because this happened to us two days ago. Like, the, yeah. I'm serious. Like, the, and so I'm curious, at what point? What point does someone have to? be to use one of these things they have to be a certain volume or it makes sense or not um but you know we had to call the person up because of you know things change their expiration date changes all these things change and then it, the payment doesn't go through and before you know and you discover it sometimes you're two months in and yeah. you're like and then it becomes like an awkward conversation you know yeah. as opposed to another three payments behind and well, mm. then you have to figure out how to catch them up and you know, all that, that Do stuff. Do you catch them up? Do you not? Like that kind of stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And so um, how do you price that, um, that piece of um, taking a piece of what you guys recapture? How did you decide yeah. on what, what to do there? So we, we basically decided on, on we didn't want to be punitive in the sense that like you had to think about it. So what we ended up doing is um, we just did a bunch of research and we were talking to our customers and this is kind of the the classic um, pricing strategy playbook that we talk a lot about, which is you know go to your customers um, and, and they'll have the answers. Now you can't ask them what's the answer, right? You have to ask them in kind of like a prosecuting attorney way, like you know, because if you ask them directly, they're not going to be able to tell you exactly what should happen. But I think for us it was you know how do we make it a no brainer, which was also something. So we're like no platform fees because because then all of a sudden we have to get like a bunch of contracts involved and we have to, you know, sell to the whole group and all this other stuff. And then it was, okay, well, we can measure this. Like, can they believe, do they believe, like, we know it's true, but do they believe it? Which is a totally different thing. Um, and they did, you know, the, the beta customers and we were like, okay, cool. So there's, there's this has legs because we always started from the premise with all of our products, like if we were going to have a perfect value metric, what would that be? And if we can't do that for certain reasons, um, then we'll pull it back. But then for us, it was, okay, well, let's charge based on how much we recover. Well, then we got an objection of, well, some of those users, they'll churn the next month. And we're like, okay, cool. Well, we'll guarantee that if they churn, let's do it. And then we got like, well, this seems like, you know, is it uncapped? Is it unlimited? You know, we got some objections there. Other people were like, yeah, we'll pay you unlimited. Just bring us as many as possible. Other people were like, ah, like I, you know, I don't feel like it's good unlimited. So we're like, okay, cool. We'll do like tiers. So basically, if we recover mm. between X and Y, the price is Z. If we recover between A and B, the price is C, and so on and so forth. And then we had some, you know, some really big customers who are like, well, like, you know, if it's if it's kind of like because the tiers don't end, right? Um, they we're like, well, if it gets to be, you know, thirty thousand dollars, like, ah, then we're gonna have to start to talk internally about maybe building this ourselves. And we're like cool, $20,000 and it's unlimited after that, right? Mm. So we, we basically started right. putting things in there and and it's just this iterative process, right? And, I would be like, good um, luck. Good luck creating that yeah. $30,000. <laughs> well, no. It took us like 10 well, years, yeah, but uh, yeah. you know, they'll come I back we'll to you to and that. mess it up. Yeah. But anyways, no, well, I, I totally We've had that. that. We yeah. have had that uh, where people are like, ah, oh, we're going to build it and then they don't and then Famous it messes up. Words. But yeah. But I think that the other side, like, so on the other side too, we were like, we don't want to be punitive to our profitable users where, you know, we recover $10 and we want to come get our $10 for that, right? So we basically set a floor too. So there's a bunch of people using Retain for free because we have a bunch of small free users on yeah. ProfitWell. They signed up for Retain, but we also don't want to go through the support cost of like trying to collect 50 bucks totally. a month. Yeah. other stuff so um i think i don't What's know what the, the minimum level right then yeah i'm not sure retail. what it is i yeah. think we will go we will send emails for like 150 to 200 bucks a month uh, but normally if someone's like under you know 100 bucks a month or on our tiers we we kind of yeah. just don't I chase mean, what it what does that equate to like what are they doing monthly that would be uh, a minimum they like be, if the company is yeah. doing Ten thousand a month, or a hundred thousand a month, or what is what no, does that equate it'd be, to? It would in... be like yeah, it would be like five to ten grand a month. Okay, like it would be a pretty small company. And so, so minimum like, would be if you're doing ten grand or more a month, 
that would be worth it to sign up or is that still too small? No, it's still worth it if it's if you're yeah. doing five to ten. We I mean, worth it for you. So I'm yeah, saying. for us it would be yeah. I think for us, like we really target um, like our our all of our outbound and our inbound. Like we're really going for people doing like fifty grand a month or more. Mm-hmm. Um, not because we don't have plenty of people less than that. It's just like that's worth our sales people's you know time and everything of like that sort. And yep. so. Yeah, I think, and then we're really, I mean, frankly, like our real target is, you know, much bigger folks, but that's kind of like the minimum, Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Totally. Um, And so uh, I can ask, I'm going to ask this and you can not answer, but um, the (laughs) minimum, uh, so at that, let's say someone's doing $20,000 a month. um, Yeah, I know there's tiers at the the base price, probably because it's the largest percentage I imagine that you take. Can you share what that is? Yeah, totally. So okay. I think it would be, um, so I, I, you know, it's funny. I haven't sold, I used to be the main salesperson on retain. I haven't sold retain in a while. I think Sells right itself, now, that's why, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, honestly, like we do now have a self-serve. We didn't always have a self-serve. Now we have a self-serve yeah. for, and we move the threshold depending on what we're seeing. I think the threshold is and like you, you, anytime we'll get on the phone with someone doing a thousand bucks a month. I know that's like, a waste of time, but we just do it because I think it's a really good touch point for our products and our, our brand. But I think that um, the percentage, like we might take that whole first month um, on, on some of that level, right? So if we recover 50 bucks, we'll wait till that second month and then we might take the $50, right? Because then it, net, it still nets out for that user. But like I said, this is why like we were getting into conversations where people were like, well, that's like 100% of it. And we're like, yes, but you already have made like three times that, you know, on that user. And it, it just like, we got them to the point where they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. This is great. But it was just so much time for $50. So that's why we were like, all right, get set up and we'll send you the email. And I shouldn't say this, but really like if you don't end up paying, we're like, we might, you know, depending on how uh, tough you were with support with us, we might be like, oh, we're going to turn this off unless you pay us yeah. or we'll kind of just like let it run basically. Yeah. So what would be the minimum? Is it, are we talking like percent, like 10%, 20%? Um, the minimum, like, so we have some that we're recovering like hundreds of thousands of dollars per month. And so the minimum is probably like five to 10%. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, I think it might actually be even lower than that. Um, but we don't, like you can calculate the percentage, but we don't think about it as the percentage. I know at some point our pricing basically goes for every extra hundred thousand dollars we recover for you. Oh, and then remember this is over their recovery. So this right. is like all free money, if you will, or found money as they say. But I think for every extra hundred thousand, we charge like five grand. So but that's over a certain threshold. Mm-hmm, so, mm-hmm. um, yeah. And then typically like, then it gets into like negotiation because these big dogs, they want special, you know, private cloud and a bunch of other things. And so it's just something to kind of think about. Yeah. So we're right at the hour, Patrick. I had two other questions. Sure. So, um, I don't want to, I know you have a million things. You have 70 people emailing you right now, <laughs> uh, for various tasks. So, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. if you have to run, I will not be offended at all. Or we no can worries, go on those two questions. Um, oh, I wanted to get your take on content. Cause I know, I mean, there's this, yeah. that's one, um, because I know you're a big proponent of content and you guys use it well. And, you, I think, I don't know, for a long time, that's your marketing strategy. Right? It still is. Yeah, still yeah. Is. yeah. I think for us, um, there, there's the first interview I ever did. Um, I what was funny is someone described or asked how I described price intelligently or something. They asked like a an, a question where this answer was appropriate and not like off off the rails. But the question or the answer was like I think of us us as like an economic think tank wrapped in a media company. Yeah, media company. Um, yeah, you talk about that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and so that's like the media company concept. Um, it wasn't something that we were like this is exactly what we're going to go after or this is the 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 concept since the beginning. Um, it was one of those things where it evolved over time. Um, but it was one of the, but but now we think of it like as a media company and you're starting to see that over the past year how we've kind of evolved into video series, um, the new website um, that'll be out in the next couple of months hopefully for the for our um, content hub um, that'll look very much like a Hulu or a Bloomberg or those types of things. And yeah, we just found content to be so powerful and we got pretty good at it. And we're kind of in a space where good content exists 
exists, but good content actually does really, really well. And so we kind of went all in on it. And so, um, yeah, content's been great for us. Yeah. So what, what suggestions, what's worked for you as far as content goes? I think that you have to, so this is kind of basic advice, but I think a lot of us don't follow it. You have to understand where in the funnel the content is for. So we have this show called Pricing Page Teardown and Profit Well Report. And the reason we have that is because we were very clear that this is middle of the funnel, if not bottom of the top of the funnel, we call it content, where if you're not interested in pricing, you're not interested in benchmarks, you're not going to watch these. You're not going to look at them. You're not going to read the blog posts. You're not really interested, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas, you know, one of our other shows, Protect the Hustle, which is our podcast, um, that's a top of the funnel, you yeah. know, that's like a very like overarching show. And so that that helped us a lot because then it was, okay, when we're developing new concepts, like we're just going to go after it. And then, you know, I think the other thing is don't forget, you know, the SEO evergreen style content, which I think is like, you know, it's kind of, it's not diametrically opposed to this strategy, but it's definitely not like they're not the same thing. And so we added back in a lot of this like SEO style, um, content, which we won't send really to our lists unless it's like a really good like piece of content, but we added in for the SEO value and things like that. And so that's been really helpful because now when they sit on top of each other, like those channels work out really well for us in terms of our spread and our brand. Yeah. I love you talking about top of funnel, middle of funnel. Um, So thanks for, thanks for mentioning that because I think it's super important to eliminate some people. Some people are afraid to turn like if it's not for everyone, they feel bad, but it it shouldn't be for everyone. You don't serve everyone, you know? So it's a product. Yeah. 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 Um, So last question, I'm combining two in one just because I want to hear your opinion on it. But I always ask this is inspired insider. What's been the, lowest moment how you push through it and we talked a little bit on the front of this interview and then what's been a proud yeah. moment from the journey um yeah. that you can talk about because as entrepreneurs oftentimes we don't celebrate things yeah. um so what's been yeah. a low moment that you had to push through and then um uh proud moment high point yeah i think low moments hard not because there ha- there's a lot of, i can name a lot of low moments but like the lowest moments hard because it's like you always rationalize like after you get through it like cool i'm i'm you know we solved that let's keep going right? yeah kind of like your co-founder I, thing you're like oh i wouldn't be here where i'm at today if yeah, i didn't go through totally. that justification yeah totally so i think a, a really low moment um it's not like a single point i think that um well, it's so tough because it's so hard to pick the worst one because <laughs> they're all <laughs> bad. Uh, no, I think like a couple of low ones. Maybe I'll, I'll give you some some volume here instead of like one. Um, yeah, I think, do um, that. Cancer wasn't like too tough. I mean, like it was tough. Don't get me wrong. Like I'm not trying to like, oh my God, I'm so tough. I'm a hero. But it was more like, um, it, it was it was like very pragmatic. Like, oh, this is happening. I now need to go solve this problem, right? Um, very much in my control, even though it wasn't like, but it felt like I can go to my treatments. I can keep my mind right. I can do these things, right? I think some some really low moments were when, when it's like not really in your control. So I think the, the part-time co-founder thing was super tough. Um, and it, it like wasn't a single moment. It was a lot of like just cycles of frustration. Um, you know, and I, I think like, I don't know if anyone had ill intentions throughout this whole thing, but it was one of those things where it still sucked. Right. Um, I think another really low moment was, um, like in the early days, I was, I mean, there were weeks where I was doing two all nighters a week, um, maybe three sometimes, which I know you're like, Oh, you're not supposed to do that. It's a marathon, not a sprint, but it's like, yeah, but I got customers who need their stuff understaffed and all these other things like the job has to get done. And those were like the frantic days that I was talking about. Um, you know, I, I, I ended up getting out of a seven year relationship during, um, profit well. And so, you know, I had this situation where, and it was, I mean, at the end of seven years, it's, it's, it wasn't, we weren't married, but you're kind of married, I guess. So yeah. when it's a common up, law marriage, let's call yeah, it. Not yeah, really, it's, but yeah, it's a bit of a divorce. Like I don't want to call it a divorce because that, I mean, I feel like a divorce is more higher, you know, intensity, but it definitely like, you know, moving out. And, um, you know, it was, it was one of those things where I think that thankfully, you know, I feel like at the end of those, they're either very volatile, like, you know, everyone's pissed or they're kind of like, this is very not working. We're going to move it's on. A mutual and it kind of, yeah, it was like the latter. Um, and I think that that was like super, that was just tough because then like shortly thereafter, like the cancer stuff, the second time happened. Um, and so that was just kind of like a, oh yeah, cool. Like, you know, I know this is for the better, but like it sucks right now. Um, 
And then finally, I think like, to be frank, I think I'm in a low point like right now. Like I know that's tough to say, right? Because like I look back and I'm like, hey, we're in a really good place. Like I could leave for a month and you know, maybe I wouldn't get, obviously I wouldn't get my stuff done, but like the business would continue. Right. Which is like really cool to be in that, that feeling. But I think right now it's a very overwhelming, like scaling problem where it's like, holy cow, like the work is so much more intense emotionally because it's all these scaling issues, which are, are, are high thought problems. It's not mm-hmm. like, Hey, I just got to get in here and fix this bug. It's like, mm. no, I have to like, you know, deal with, you know, Tetris of people's emotions and hiring the right people and planning. And so, yeah, and I think proud moments. I think um, every Christmas we so we have an office in Rosario, Argentina. It's about ten folks, um, and then the rest of folks are in Boston. And so every Christmas we have this conference. It's it's you know maybe the second week of of December, or the first week depending on mm-hmm. the schedules. And um, we bring everyone to Boston, and we do this during the summer as well for like a retreat, um, or we'll go somewhere. Like sometimes it's Austin, Texas. Sometimes it's New Hampshire, et cetera. But I always love those moments because when I look around, it's like, it's this, it's a feeling of like pride in the sense of like, I remember last time this happened, I was like, there's everyone here I would bring home to like hang out with my parents. Mm. Like I'd be weird. Like everyone, that's cool. Like, yeah. Like there's a bunch of problems. Like this guy or gal is not, you know, they need to fix this. And as long as they like cheese curds. Percent. Right. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But I think that's the thing. Like the team at the end of the day, the team is, is what, what makes it. And, yeah. um, that's a dangerous feeling because it's, it's, you know, there's, there's a mission that really is what we're focused on. And sometimes, you know, you need to prune some of the team and sometimes you're going to make mistakes with your team, but that's, that's the big thing. And I think, I mean, when we cross like, you know, a million dollars for the first time. And then when we had our like million dollar quarter for the or, um, month for the first time, like those, those things are really cool. But I think it's, I mean, I, I've, I'm really happy that I got to a place where like the money aspect is really important. And that's how we measure like our success as a whole, but it's not like the driving factor, which I think is, it's a very subtle nuanced point there, but it's, yeah. I think it's really cool that like, you know, that's where we're trying to go for product for our user experience. Um, and we're willing to, we're now very aligned on making sacrifices in the short term for money and for long term gain, if that makes sense. Yeah. Patrick. I want to be the first one to thank you. This has been absolutely fantastic. I'm holding back on all the questions I've written down because I want to respect your time a little bit. Um, but but this has been fantastic. I want to put a plug in for the conference. What's the conference name um, and who's who should be going to the conference? Obviously, subscription companies, I imagine. But what's it called? Yeah. Where, where can people find it? It's called Recur. Uh, so it's mm-hmm. Recur uh, Boston. Um, you can find it on the Profile website. Okay. Um, we, um, it's in Boston. It's, we keep it fairly like intentionally small. So Mm. about 200 people max. Um, and then we also do like a smaller exec and founder only session that we limit to about 30, 40 people for one of the days. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's, it's very much focused on like bringing execs and founders of subscription companies Mm -hmm. together. It's a single track conference, plenty of time to like network and meet everybody. And, um, yeah, it's a pretty, it's, we really enjoy it because it's, it's very in line with how we think about the values and stuff like that. Like, you know, we're we're not going to get Pitbull to come play or anything like that. It's more about like the learning and the connections rather than like just having a good time. Although we do have a really good time as well. Yeah. So everyone should check out profitwell.com. It's profit, W-E-L-L.com. They're doing amazing things. Patrick, thank you so much. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it. Yeah. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire. Came out better on the other like a beach if you find the sand right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand